Howdy once again, it's Tubal Kane, your internet shop teacher. Welcome back. This is tips number 472 on the reconditioning and reassembling of the pull gear gear reduction device. Now watch, if you have not already, tips 470 and 471 where I have taken this apart. So this video is devoted to uh, reassembling and several other things that I need to do it and do to it. And as I told you, I I ordered new bearings. I needed uh, three new bearings, so there they are, straight from Michigan, ready to go in a sealed package. But let me talk and spend a little bit of time about uh, planetary gear systems and what they are and the purpose of them and uh, how, how they work. I'm not an expert on gears by any means, but you know, planetary gears were used way back, a long time ago. It's nothing new at all. Matter of fact, Leonardo da Vinci talked about them. He wasn't able to construct them, but he talked about them. But Henry Ford used them in all the Model Ts, and they're just used in countless devices. I had one in my 54 Mercury Overdrive. They use them in bicycles and just all kinds of different places. But let me show you uh, one that I have here on the premises. Then we'll talk about this. I used to be famous, yeah I was famous alright, for my cutaways. And I made a lot of cutaways in my uh, What Makes It Work series. Nobody watched them so I stopped doing that. But I bought this bicycle for five bucks uh, last fall and the whole purpose of me buying it was I was going to sh do a cutaway of the rear hub here. This is a three-speed bicycle. I had one I, when I was a kid from England. I just love this. It's so far superior to the derailleur system, the, the 15 speeds, which is so foolish. You don't need 15 speeds. So rather than take this apart, I've been riding it. This thing, this thing works like a child. It, uh, it shifts. And uh, Tolly had sent me this. This is a brand new five speed uh, system. Well, why am I showing you bicycles? Who cares to hoots about this? Well, this has a planetary gear in it. This one has two planetary gear systems in them, and I don't know if you can see or not, but uh, here in the parts list is the two different uh, gear systems. Thanks for this, Tolly. That's all the time I'm going to waste talking about other types of planetary gear systems because they're just used in so many, many different devices. But of course, the devices are, are sealed like this, so you can't really tell what's in there. Furthermore, nobody cares. I shouldn't say nobody cares because this particular cutaway that I made some time ago of a coaster break was intriguing and had an awful lot of views, but the people that watched this video are not my regular machine shop viewers. They are really bicyclists, I think, and, and they did, did like this very much. So that's what I was going to do with that uh, three-speed planetary system. But, oh, I'm way off topic, way off subject here, although maybe not. But I was going to do a cutaway of this. Well, I don't want to ruin it. So, in fact, I'm not going to do a cutaway of this planetary system, but I'm going to try to explain it uh, in my layman's terms because I'm not an engineer. However, uh, since I don't want to ruin this and cut it away, I'm making a, a visible one with a, with plexiglass so you can see through it. So I've already done that. Let me throw it together real quickly here. But first, let me talk about the different parts. We really have a series of gears. This is the sun gear. The sun gear is in the middle, like a solar system, I guess you could say. And then these are the planetary gears that go around it. And this is the, the ring gear and some people call it the reactive gear, I think. Somebody wrote that in. I believe that's one of the terms maybe that engineers use. So let me go ahead and put that carrier on the, uh, that, that holds these. We call that, the, I guess we call that the carrier. There's an awful uh, lot of information on Wikipedia about this uh, and, and other videos. So check them out if you have an interest in gears and how they work. Looking at it from this side, from the plexiglass here, you can see that we have the sun gear in the middle, and that's what's driven by this shaft. It's falling apart on me. So the sun gear is driven, but in some systems the, the driving gear will be on the other end, but let's talk about the more basic ones. So let me put this real quickly onto the, uh, the ring gear. I might have told you once before that most often you're going to see three planetary gears rather than the four. But in fact, there's only two here. 
two of these uh, are idler gears, that is this one and this one are more or less idler gears that are only used in this assembly to reverse the direction of rotation. Otherwise when this was installed on the drill press you'd have to run the motor in reverse. So you'd have to have a, a reversing switch and all of that and that would make it complicated. So they put an extra set of gears in here to reverse it. Them. Again, I'm calling them idler gears, but what happens here when we turn the driven shaft, which is the sun gear, you can see the powertrain here. And this is a bit of a jammer here because I don't have good bearing. I hope this is a clearer view now. I got it running a little better, but visualize the cover on here with the carrier. Now the plastic is the carrier. This is the input shaft, but it, in fact it's being driven at the other end by the belt pulley. And notice that the shaft is turning faster than the clear plastic. In fact, there's a 4.5 to 1 ratio. Again, essentially using two planetary gears instead of three disregard the fact that there's four because two of them are idler gears used to reverse. I said that before. But hopefully this gives you a little idea of what's going on inside of this pull gear reducer. And then when you lock them together, of course they're running at one and the same speed. This is the original advertising sheet and I told you that it was available in two different gear ratios and I might have told you wrong. I might have told you in a video a long time ago that it was a 7 to 1 ratio like this but in fact this is the 4.5 to 1 uh, reduction ratio which probably was the more popular one and the size and diameter and number of teeth on the gears would have to have uh, been different in order to produce the 7 to 1 that might have been a little slower ratio than what's necessary, but how was that determined? Let me show you. Real quickly regarding the gear ratio, the sun gear has 14 teeth and the ring gear has 64 teeth. So just doing the real simple math, and don't waste your time with a stupid cal calculator. They're so slow, and you know they don't work if the batteries go out or the lights go out. So you know we got to return to the basics here so that just very quickly here using the old slip stick here I have determined that the ratio is 4.571 but of course we have uh, rounded that off to four and a half before I install the bearings and start to reassemble there are just a few things that I want to do. To start with I have already filled this hole. Do you remember how buggered up that hole was? And that's the hole that holds the rod so that uh, when you're in the slow speed it prevents this from turning. Uh, we'll talk more about that later but it was just so wallowed out and it's broken out here so I filled it with the uh, Oh, what was a JB weld? And I don't like the term JB weld because it has nothing to do with welding. It's epoxy. So I filled that. That's a couple days ago. I was going to put this on the lathe and uh, and take a little bit off, take a light cut. I decided against that for several reasons. First of all, uh, I did try gripping it, and it just doesn't run true at all. I'd have to make an arbor. I'd have to just spend a lot of time on that. I'm not willing to do that. So I'm just going to file it down, but you know, it just looks terrible here where it's broken out. And then I also, on the exact opposite side here, I'm going to drill and tap a fresh new hole. And that will be arbitrarily and capriciously decided upon to be 3816. And uh, again, let me show you why I do not want to take much off on this. If I did take a little bit off, then I would probably want to take a little more off of this. And this is badly damaged by Bubba as well. But there's just no uh, material allowed here. I would run into the bolt or the bolt hole here. And I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to do that. However, I am going to clean this up on the lathe. We'll talk about that. But let me do this one first. And I'm not going to show all of it. 
All right, I've carried this out as far as I can without doing some major reconstruction. Uh, again, the hole is filled. I drilled and tapped a 3816 on the other side for the appropriate size. This isn't the right size, but for the stop rod to go into. So that's all I can do with that now. So I'll turn my attention to the other piece. Now I'm turning my attention to the pulley and this is just in terrible shape and so many people have said we'll make a new one well that's not an easy piece to make because uh, there are two bearing recesses and uh, those are critical dimensions and the distance between the two bearings is very critical as this uh, space for the ring gear and then so that's not something I'm going to do others mentioned that I had a machine off the grooves here and press on uh, a new pulley or maybe just one shiv you don't need all of these but I'm not going to do any of that I'm just going to do the best I can with what I got but the, this thing will be out of balance anyway we've got a big chunk knocked out of there and I've already taken a file and dressed up the best I could but it is rougher than a cob and I'm sure it'll be hard on the rubber belts but uh, one thing that I am going to do, I'm going to put it in the three jaw chuck right now and lightly file this and I think I'll take a light cut. This just looks terrible and somebody pointed out that this was beaten on or pried or something from time to time to remove it from uh, the motor, the electric motor. So that's probably where all that damage came from. So let me put it in the three jaw and take a light cut and while I still have it in the three jaw, I'll emery cloth this just a little bit. But there are marks. It looks like somebody had a pull around there and uh, really just did a number on it. But there's only so far I can go in this restoration. Well, it looks 10% better, perhaps only 8%, but I took a, a light facing cut, but those gouges there are way too deep to take out. I did clean this up a little bit and took off 10 thousandths off of the high spots here, but it, it looks terrible. That's going to chip out sooner or later, or break out. Well, that's as good as I can get it. I am ready for assembly. Okay, this is just a, a sample of uh, something that you can consider when you assemble things. The, the plate is about 350 degrees now, but these bearings, and do not open the bearings so you're ready to use them, but remember these have a rubber seal on both sides so they can't be overheated. That'll burn off. So I, I'm just demonstrating here how easy it would be to install a bearing here without pounding on it or pressing or anything else. This in fact is the old bearing and I put a bolt in there just so I have a handle on it. This is cold, room temperature and since this is now heated up and it's hotter than a pistol, a little bit of oil burning off from that bearing in there but look at this bearing that would be a press fit. That's how much this casting has expanded. So I could put the good bearing in there right now. I'm not quite ready to do it. And uh, just, just put it in there like that. Make sure it's all the way down. And take this over to the sink and cool it off before the heat could be transferred and damage that seal. Just a suggestion. In fact, that's what I'm going to do right now. And then I'll rush over to the sink off camera. And... Okay, that bearing's in there. I don't want that seal to get uh, damaged, so over to the sink I go off to, to cool it off. Well, I got one bearing in, and that would have been the easiest one to install of all, but I'm just showing you that option. But certainly one could have uh, tapped it in with a, uh, a piece of wood. You could have drawn it in with a bolt, could have pressed it in on the arbor press, pushed it in with a vise, as long as you keep it uh, straighted and don't cock it. So that's done. 
And I have pondered this for several days on what is the order of assembly, and I'm sure there is a better way, or there is a best way, that they use at the factory to put this together, but I'm just uh, second guessing, so mine maybe is uh, only the good way or the better way, but not the best way. I don't know, but concentrating on this piece, the next thing I will do is to put the four gears into place and push these pins in. Also, there are two cap screws here that go in and they just, the heads just barely catch the rim of this bearing so that the bearing can't come out. A light tapping is all these pins seem to need. And they've been oiled. This is 5,000 thick shim stock, so I don't press them too tight. Is that necessary? I don't know. I'm just doing it. Okay, and I'll do the two others the same. All right, that piece is pretty well assembled, bearing in little uh, screws in there. From this side, I need to put the Gitz oilers on, but that can be done later on. I cleaned out those oil holes real well. I'm lucky that the heat didn't seem to damage that uh, epoxy there. Well, now my attention turns to the other part, and I'm a little bit of a quandary as to the uh, order of assembly here, but I think I'm going to start by pressing the, bear, the large bearing over the gear. In other words, that's the one that goes on like that, and I'll do that on that arbor press, and I don't think you need to see that, but uh, here's the bearing. Where is it at here? I already took it out of the paper. Now when you hammer bearings in, I shouldn't say hammer, but press them or however you handle them, do not press by the inner race. For instance, use a, oh, a pusher like this on the inner race. You need to push on the outer part because that can damage the bearing, literally trying to force that inner portion out. So, and, and never hammer directly on them. Well, there's just a lot of care that you need to consider when you're handling bearings because you don't want to damage them when you're putting them in. I've seen it happen. By the way, there are the bearing numbers. You saw the old numbers in the other video. So, uh, I just pressed that bearing on. They went on nicely. I did use a three-quarter drive socket. I forgot what size. Uh, to push over. Worked nicely. Now comes the tricky part. This, of course, is the bearing that goes here. And I think I will put that on last after the rest of this, the assembly, but for now I'm going to try to put that on with the shaft. I guess the question to myself is, should I go ahead and press this shaft into this bearing? And of course I have to line up this gear, the, the sun gear, with the other gears as I do that, which then I would have a good visibility of, of what I'm doing. Or, should I press that in first and then attempt to assemble this whole unit into this unit? There has to be one way that is better than the other, and I hate to start pressing and then have to pry it or knock it apart again and try the opposite way. So. It's a little bit of a Chinese puzzle right now for me. I took a vote between myself and my alter ego and decided to press the shaft into this bearing first so I can see what I'm doing and then lastly put this part on. So we'll see what happens. I hope I don't have to knock it apart. And I'll do that off camera. Simply it's so difficult to set up a camera in the dark garage and all that. I don't think you need to see that. 
Well, that took about 10 minutes of fiddling around, and I tell you, it really taxed that little ton and a half dig press. I'm still breathing hard. But I think it's okay. And now the question is can I press this into this? And mesh the teeth. It was kind of tricky meshing the teeth with the input shaft a minute ago. But that's the general idea of what I need to do now is to press these two together. I think I'll save that for last, although maybe that should be in there. But if it is, I'm really pressing two things at one time. Two bearings at one time, which I don't really want to do. If I had a hydraulic press, I probably would. And now the very last part is to put this, and that's going to break off. That's loose. Can't worry about it, I guess. This will go on like this. And I can tap it on, but I think maybe I'll take it out to the press and press it on. But i, I got to make sure that the gears are meshed first. And they are. And it looks like it's going to go on in this manner. Alright, that's about as far as it goes together. It seems to me that that's a little bit wider gap than what I originally had. I'm not sure. But, and it's noisy. It's very noisy. I think that's just going to howl at higher speed. But you know what I believe? I believe that all of the gears are worn out and that this is just a worn out unit. Even with new bearings, it's not going to be great. But at least we had the fun, that is if this was fun, of doing it. And finally here, the very last bearing that I will press on. Probably this way, or I might go out into the uh, garage with the press. Well, you know what? We're getting near the end here, so I need to make a new pin. Remember what this locking device is. Actually, I should remake that, but I'm not in the mood. It's going to have to be good enough. But this is the old pin. You can see that it's bent. Remember, I had to file it off. But upon examining it in detail, I'm looking at it, and of course it's been headed. I'm thinking, you know, that looks an awful lot like a nail. See where the grippers held it when they headed it? Now, maybe that's what they used at the factory. I don't know. Or did somebody replace that with a nail? Well, it's a hundred thousandths in diameter, or thereabout. So, I'm just looking around at nails, and I'll be darned if a 6D box nail, 2-incher, they're galvanized, I don't need them galvanized, but, but that is exactly what I need. Uh, it's more or less, well, not more or less, it's 99,000, so that was a nail. So, getting ahead of myself here, I already took the liberty of cutting it to length, a nail out of this box and as uh, Providence would have it that's about a number three so I did indeed thread it 348 you're not going to be able to read that can't read it myself I put about a quarter inch of thread on there so and then I did have a nut but I don't like it I thought I'd have a whole bunch of nuts I got 256 and I got a million four forties and all right so I think I'll go down to the hardware store and get a better one or I'll make one up out of brass and I think I showed you in one of the earlier videos where someone showed me a picture of one of these it was equipped with a nut on there whether it was put on uh, later or not I don't know but 
simply threading the spring on, dropping it in, and grabbing it. I know you can't see a thing. Hold it like that. Put the nut on. We talked about my hands looking like a corpse. One time I was at a funeral and when no one was looking I went and I touched the deceased hands. They looked better than mine. But like somebody said, they got makeup on them. But they were hard as a rock. So I was, and cold of course, you know what do you expect. But I didn't like it and I'll never touch another corpse in my life. All right. So, and that might be a little too long, we'll see. But of course the whole idea here of locking this thing is to lift and... And I might have to double nut that. That's going to be a place where I'll scratch myself. But the reason I didn't head it like the original, you know, I can take it apart. Maybe all of the originals were made that way. I don't know. Well, one more thing to do, and tomorrow I will... Now it's locked up, see? Do it like that, she'll spin. All right. I have to drill and tap a hole. Then I'm going to have to make a bushing for this. Because this is three quarters. And I believe my motor shaft is either half or five eighths. I got to measure it. So I'll have to make a bushing unless I have one in stock. So I really have those two things left to do before the job is done and I'm glad of it and uh, I put the oilers in there as you can see. All right, that's enough for today. I'll see you on the morrow to finish this up. I'm back. It's the next day and I'm about done. I've been doing a few things uh, since I videotaped last and one is I tapped a 5 16 hole for a set screw right here and that goes all the way through such that it is gripping on a flat spot on this three quarter inch shaft because I'm going to test run it here in a minute but just in the lathe. I have uh, pressed a little bit farther so the gap here is reduced probably about to what it was when I started. I don't know. I should have measured it with feeler gauges. And I went to the hardware store. I wanted to get a nice little knurled nut they had nothing in size threes. They had some twos, but I wanted to get one of these, and I may still make one or bush that so I have a little knob there that's a little bit larger in diameter. But they don't have anything like that. They don't have anything that won't sell that might be on the shelf for more than 90 days to get rid of it. That's the way all the box stores are, too. All right, so. Uh, what else did I do? Put some oil in there. Now, as I told you before, this is going to be a real oil slinger. And somebody told me that in one of the comments. They said, boy, do these throw the oil because there's just no provision for retaining oil. He even suggested that a, some type of O-ring be installed in there. But of course, I'm not going to do that. Remember, I got that 3 8 hole there. And for the hold back, I'm just going to use a piece of threaded rod. I, I'm, I'm been working on this for three weeks and I'm kind of glad that it's coming to a conclusion and I like very much the way this works. Well, does it? Yeah, like that. So, let's put it in the lathe and see what happens. As I conclude this lengthy three-part or more video, I have set the pull gear up here on the closing lathe, and I've got it set at 450 RPM just to show you the reduction. And of course there would be 
uh, a belt going to the chuck on the drill, the spindle. So we got three speeds there and then really two speeds here because we have the direct and the gear reduction of four and a half to one ratio. So watching the, uh, these are actually orange. I don't know why they appear that color on the screen. They're orange. They're price tags. But anyway, I've got the uh, stop rod here installed and let me turn it on at 450 RPM and watch the reduction which means there'll be about a hundred RPM here on the show. Pretty slick, huh? 450, 100. And to put it in direct drive, of course, it's a matter of removing the stop rod, which is quick enough, and locking this in. You know what, i got to learn how to do that. Quite a bit of play in it. I need to tighten up the set screw there. Now we are in direct drive. Well, I hope you liked the rebuild here. I know I took a couple shortcuts, I always do, but it took three weeks to make this video as it is, on and off, of course. So it's, it's a big project, and I'd like to get into shorter projects rather than these long ones, but I thank uh, my friend for giving this to me, and I thank you for watching. And if there's a, a lot of views on this, I will do a follow-up video on uh, installation of this on the drill press and perhaps even using it on the drill press to show you how it will work with larger drill bits like three quarter and one inch to see if we have a slippage of the belt because many people warn me you know how the doomsday people are this doesn't work anyway throw it away because the belts are going to slip so the only real uh, solution is a VFD. Well I've done that and I've, I've done a lot of other things to reduce the speed. I'm just showing you different methods and uh, again F Frank gave this to me. Thank you Frank. I'm sure he's watching. Thank you for watching the videos. I have a lot of them out there. There's 900 and some so go back and watch some of those old ones if you're a new viewer. This is Tubal Kane saying so long for now and I'll see you in my next video.